Welcome to the GameDev.TV Community Podcast. I'm your host KB, and I would like to introduce you to industry professionals and people who successfully made their path to the video game industry. I hope that you will enjoy the podcast and get useful tips that will bring you closer to achieving your dreams. Now, let's get right into the podcast. So welcome to the GameDev.TV Podcast. We have Paul Stefanak here today. He's an expert in game development for over 20 years, working on a wide range of project types, team sizes, including AAA, PC, AAA console, social, mobile titles. You can give the fans a little bit more about who you are, and we can go from there. Sure. Hey, I've been making and playing games pretty much my whole life. Uh, I've been doing it professionally, like you said, for like the last uh, 20-something years. Uh, The bulk of that at this point has been doing uh, mobile and free-to-play type games. I got started in AAA back in the day. Uh, working on strategy games uh, for big, huge games published by Microsoft. Uh, if anybody goes back that far, Rise of Nations was the first title I ever worked on. Um, did a bunch of stuff back then. Um, got involved with Zynga back before, even before those Ville games came out. Uh, really? No <laughs> yeah, way. yeah. We were Mafia Wars, if you can remember back that. Oh, far, I right? loved and, Mafia Wars. Yeah, so did I. That's I was I was playing a lot of it, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, so we joined up with them. Uh, started working on some browser-based games like Mafia Wars, and then that whole Farmville thing happened, right? And the whole Mm -hmm. world changed overnight. Uh, And ever since then, I've been doing uh, social, mobile, and free-to-play games. I've worked for small studios, big studios, uh, electronic arts, uh, and now these days I am the uh, design director for Candy Crush and King in Stockholm, Sweden. Oh, wow. You got all the good mobile games. I'm trying to get around, yeah, for sure. So how did you get started with game development? Was it something you wanted to do in school or afterwards? Uh, It came a little bit later. This is my second career. Um, So I've always been a gamer, um, and I'm old enough where I can even remember, you know, not owning a personal computer in the house, Mm -hmm. if you can believe that, right? And so I was caught up in the, uh, you know, I'm a kid, a child of the 80s, got got caught up in video games back when they first came out. Uh, It was a big damn Mm -hmm. deal. I uh, got my first computer as a kid and played around with it and really kind of went down the uh, I'm going to be a computer programmer route, frankly, okay. and, and got swept up in in uh, automotive industry stuff and database programming. I, but all the while, I was playing my heart out. I played literally play every video game that came out. I uh, also play a lot of board games, play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, you know, all, there you the, go. all the all the all the stuff. Right. It, if it was a game, I was going to play it digital, analog or otherwise. And uh and then about 2000, uh, the year 2000, uh, a very good friend of mine who, you know, we've been best buds since high school, he was starting a new game studio uh, and had sent me an email saying, hey, you know, I'm just sending this to all my friends and I've got these names for my studio, uh, you know, which one do you like? And I said, I like this one. And oh, by the way, um, you know, the thing, I, the gig that I'm working on right now is winding down. I would I want to I want to make games like yeah. it's like all right well come on up we're starting a new studio come on up and interview so I went up and interviewed and it worked out and and uh, got my first job really like I said my second career um, later in life but uh, that was still twenty years ago I'm just that old and um, yeah and then so started making games uh, started as a um, really came in the door as the IT guy because uh, because that's how they justified could justify hiring this this guy that was unknown. Uh, but I did have a lot of software development experience, so I quickly became a producer and then a designer, all in rapid succession. And then I spent oh, wow. a lot of my early career going back and forth between game design and production. Um, depends on you know when exactly. I think I was a producer first, and then a game designer, and then a producer again, and then design. I mean, I've, I've gone back and forth between those two those two spheres throughout the entire course of my career, frankly, because okay. um, I'm mostly interested in getting games made. I mean, I tell people I'm a game designer. Um, because I think at this point I've technically been a game designer more than a producer, but for me, it's mostly about getting a game built, right? You know, yeah. and so I'm kind of willing to, you know, I'm willing to put in wherever it takes, whatever it takes to, um, to get a game built and, uh, yeah. And producers frankly hold as much sway over that as, as designers do. That's for sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I go back and forth. Wow. But that's that's kind of crazy switching jobs, going from like IT to then going to video games. For people who want to make that change, what advice would you give them? Well, I think you know, knowing the language of games first and foremost. You know, again, I came to that moment having had you know a lot of game literacy, right? You know, I've been playing mm-hmm. games most of my life. I'm not not just playing them, but thinking about them, right, and talking yeah. about them. And you know, not really knowing the language of like you know how is a game made and and, and mm-hmm. 
what is a rule mechanic and what's a mechanic and what's an aesthetic and, you know, speaking the language, right? You know, so I, you know, definitely as a wannabe at that point. <laughs> exactly. But, but, but at least I, I, you know, moment. yeah, yeah. And, and I probably was totally, uh, you know, full of myself at that point. But, you know, but at least I, I kind of knew what I was excited about, right? You know, and, and could talk some of the talk. Um, and, uh, so the, so at that point, it's the advice that a lot of people used to take, uh, which was just get a job, any job in the games industry, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and then show your, show your, show your, get the opportunity to show your abilities back in those days, you know, the most common route was to do that through, uh, quality assurance to get a QA gig, right. You know, um, you know, nowadays, but see back then there wasn't a class, there was no classes you could take. There was no school programs. Right. Um, I think yeah. that. I think that get a job, any job mentality, I mean, it still works, but I think today, and I, and I see a lot of uh, resumes and a lot of interviews, and I think a better approach actually than the one I took is to build something, build it. Instead of get a job, get any, get any job, I think it's more build something, build anything, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, because having built a thing and having had the experience of putting a project together and most importantly, finishing a project, you mm -hmm. know, is the kind of thing that when we're looking for, um, whether it's producer or designer or artist or, or per, any of the disciplines, you know, having completed the process front to back and having, you know, that's actually more valuable than just about anything else, especially as a junior. Um, and so that's the thing that's really going to set you apart and differentiate you, um, knowing what you're going to have to go through to, to actually accomplish the thing you're setting out to do. Now, programming is kind of easy to build something, but like for designing and producing, how would you build something that shows like, hey, I did this. This shows I'm a designer, or especially for a producer. How does it show that I'm? A well, producer? yeah, that's the hard. That's definitely the hardest yeah. one. And I think the thing with the producers, you probably don't ultimately have a work product to show, other than the game itself, right? Mm -hmm. So having worked on a team and then said this came, you know, this product came to be because I helped be a producer. It turns out, you know, having worked with a lot of uh, game jams. Mm -hmm. and and student groups that that really valuable producers really turn out to be um the make or break point in those games so so you'll find if, if you really want to do your design chops showing up as somebody who actually wants to be the producer um if you're good at it you know and care about it you're actually going to make a huge difference and you're going to find a lot of value that your team is going to you know going to lift you up uh as like oh this you know this guy or gal was definitely the the person that helped make this thing happen because that's actually one of the least appreciated things until you until you've experienced trying to trying to mm -hmm. build something um and uh showing that value to people uh being the glue that holds the project together um will definitely get you a lot of credit so simply you know the currency of production is shipping product right so the i think it's the only answer is to to ship some product as small as it takes right it doesn't matter mm -hmm. it doesn't be big but just having done that um, that so that advice of do anything, you know, ship something, ship anything, uh, probably applies to the producer more than any because you can't show some code. Now a designer can show design documents, right? You know, a designer okay. can definitely, you know, you don't have to implement code as a designer to show that you're a good designer. You can you can either write critically or create a design document or you know or put together a very crude game that you know maybe looks. A little bit awkward but we'll look past that because we know you're not an artist mm -hmm. or runs a little awkward because we know you're not a programmer like if you got a little bit of those skills you can sort of make something manifest mm -hmm. but um but frankly you know i don't hire a lot of programmers i mean sorry i don't hire a lot of designers based on their ability to program you know mostly i look at design documents right you know yeah. how would you solve this design problem or if it's a more narrative focused designer like design some quests in, in you know mm -hmm. for this type of game or you know those kind of problems um, or if an economy designer, you know, balance this particular set of problems. You know, there's lots of different types of game designers, frankly, mm -hmm. right? You know, because there's lots of different games, and those different games have different kinds of problems, right? Um, okay. So, so you know, tear off, figure out what part of that big, uh, big old pie you want, and then tear off some small piece of it and try to accomplish something there, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so then, do you have an experience where you've solved like a really challenging game design problem, and like how would you do it? Oh, all the time. Like, you know, I'm in the middle of that right now. I think, uh, okay, so here's a more fun one from earlier on. Okay. So uh, I'm sure you've played, uh, you know, games with three players, right? You yeah. know, 
And you know how that's always – with the three players, it's always hard because, you know, one person attacks one person and the third person just kick back, kicks back and laughs while the first two yeah. players – and then comes in and sweeps like, up, where right? Where are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the third person sweeps up, right? You know, two people mm-hmm. fight and then – okay, so that's, we call we call that the three-player the three player problem, right? And some games, you know, frankly, a lot of games have that. Um, so um, when we were doing Rise of Nations, which is our early real-time strategy game um, – we wanted the game to work with three players. And so I, I, I kind of just woke up one day and I was like, you know, I want to solve the three player problem for this game. And so uh, I created uh, a game mode uh, called, uh, called Assassin. And it was based on okay. the, uh, you know, the, the Assassin game that we used to play in high school. Uh, some people call no it tag. Way, really. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. You know, where everybody gets a, hit, a person that you're trying mm-hmm. to target. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it was that for a real time strategy game. So it, so instead of it takes the game, it doesn't matter how many players there are, which, of course, means it works with three players and you get only one person that you're allowed to attack. Right. And there's one person that that's allowed to attack you. So there's no more of this three person in problem. You only have one person that you're worried about attacking you and one person that you're going after. And then when somebody gets eliminated, the world shrinks, you know, that list shrinks mm-hmm. and that shrinks again. Okay. Um, so that was me as a junior designer, you know, trying to make a fun three player version because frankly, real time strategy games with three players often suck because <laughs> because of that, that three player, yeah, that third player, on each other or... the team up, right? The team yeah. up problem. So that's an example of a, of a, of a you know, a real problem that I set out to design and it was pretty successful. I mean, you know, it was an alternate game mode, so not everybody played it, right? You know, yeah. it wasn't a it wasn't a big deal, but I was really proud of it. And every now and then somebody would say how cool it was and it felt really, you know, made me feel smart. And you know, uh so you know, so, you know, wrong so with that? yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that, especially when you're new. Um so um, you know, but that's a good example of of finding some situation that's cropping up in your game or in games in general and saying, oh, I'm going to set out to solve that. And in this case, like like in most cases, the answer often lies by looking at other game patterns, you know, mm-hmm. games that, that and then say, well, it kind of doesn't, it's not a problem there. Why isn't it a problem there? Oh, I see why, because there is a solution, right? And then taking that solution, that pa- the word is pattern, you know, that game pattern from another game and adapting it to your game. And some patterns will adapt and some won't. In this case, I had the good fortune to see a pattern in a completely unrelated type of game, right, you know, and apply it to my game. Uh, Sometimes it's a little closer to home. Sometimes you see something in a competitor's product and you like and you just steal like an artist, as they say. (laughs) You know, sometimes you uh, uh, take it and plus one it, you know, adapt Mm -hmm. it. Or sometimes, like in this case, you reach out to some other completely different type of game and and adapt what, what, what you learn from that other type of game to your type of game. So you, could you say that, like to be a really good game designer, you'd have to like observe a lot of things in other games, like mechanics and rules and why oh, they absolutely. actually worked here and maybe why it didn't work here and then take that information, maybe have a notebook and just like jot down what your thoughts were in the game? Dude, I have hundreds of notebooks. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, seriously. If you're not the kind of person that looks at a game and asks yourself why the game works, not just mm-hmm. that it has... Like, you know, everybody everybody has opinions about games. So let's mm-hmm. so here's, I'll dispel a myth. Game designers don't have a monopoly on getting to decide what's fun in a game. Like that's mm-hmm. something that some people think a game designer's job is to decide what's fun, and that's just frankly crap. Like like every yeah. anybody everybody plays games. Everybody knows if they like something. Else. Fun that's doesn't not, always mean fun to everyone. Right, it means exactly. Something totally different. That is well. not the game designer's job. The game designer's job is to understand why something works right you know and how it works and and be able to reproduce it or adapt it or or in many cases uh, decide why not to do it right you know sometimes you want to people want to do a thing and it's not the right thing and you have to be able to tell them why that's not going to work Um, not just because you know i don't think it'll be fun because that's purely subjective um so, yeah, so you've got to be the kind of person that looks at a game and is able to sort of take it apart mentally, you know, and then communicate, understand why those parts fit together like a big puzzle. And then, you know, ideally be able to w- communicate it to other designers in a perfect world, be able to communicate to everybody, not just others. So I think as a junior designer, you're still learning how to translate from, you know, specialty, special domain knowledge to, you know, use words hard hard use words speak in ways that people understand like you know mostly you want to talk in techno jargon right you know and then translating that so that everybody can get on board be as you get more senior um like learning how to um you know take those 
feelings, un- those understandings, those lessons, and pushing them out so that the whole team, so that the artist understands, so that the, so that the engineers understand, so that the producers understand, um, you know, um, that you have like a, really good communication skills. Yeah, is, yeah. You, you either have to be able to speak really well, or write really well, or draw really well. You, you know, preferably two of those three things is better. And if you can do all three of those things well enough, then then you're gonna go far. Okay. So the base of the three main things is like practice speaking in front of people, practice your writing, and practice drawing. Because mo- most of the time, I feel like it's a lot of people focus more on like. The 3D art part of it, or the the programming, or or something else, but they get lost in the details, and not what they need to actually communicate. Well, as a designer, I do zero 3D art. I do zero. In fact, I do art, zero art of any kind. I don't I don't mm-hmm. know how to draw very well. Um, I do, you know, as somebody who's been building games for 20 years, do have a lot of language about how to communicate with artists. So I do understand the language of what they do, and can communicate very clearly to to an artist or to an art director, um, what it is that I like or don't like about an art, a, a piece of art or a, or a game scene or something like that. Like in this image behind you, I could tell if, if that was a piece of art, directed art, I could tell the artist what I liked or didn't like. What I could not do because I'm not an artist is either A, draw that image, you know, create that image myself, mm-hmm. B, um, inspire another artist to create it because <laughs> I'm not an art leader, or even C, uh, fully understand why the magic behind it of why it does what it does. Like it's just that's just not in my skill set. I could say if I didn't like it, I could I could use the right words to explain what I don't like, so I can be efficient mm-hmm. in communicating with my art partner. Uh, but that's not my area of expertise. In the same way that my partner should be able to tell me what's fun, you know, why they think it's fun. They should be you know be able to reflect on the yeah. why, uh, but they might not know the how. Right. You know, they Mm. might not understand the secret sauce underlying it. And I don't understand the secret sauce of the pretty picture, um, but I definitely have the words to communicate that I don't like. the. the, I feel like the lighting here is, you know, makes me feel a certain way or, you know, that's actually the the, the hack that I use mostly when talking with artists is I talk more about the emotion than Mm. than the the technical aspect of it. And that seems to give them what they need. so, you know, again, you don't have to necessarily go study art to do game design. Now, if you're going to do level design, which is a, you know, a connected but related thing, you will need a sense of a spatial awareness. And, you know, they're working with 3D elements would definitely improve your your level design chops if you're if you're looking for level uh, level design work. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so so again, game design is a big tent. Right. And so, yeah. um, you know, there are lots of different same way, you know, there's a lot of people that call themselves designers that do um, economy modeling. Right. Not everybody has to become a math wizard and an economy model or to be an economy. But that's certainly an area of game design. Um, some people are narrative designers. They're gifted storytellers and narrative artists. Right. You know, uh, not everybody has to carry those skills. You know, different games have different needs in these areas. And. You know, it's a really big. T- I think when you're really junior at this and you're trying to get in, I think the the goal is to be, uh, is to find the one or you're on a journey to find the parts of, of game design that you really excel at. And mm. so I would, I, you know, I would encourage people to try a lot of things. It's one of the few, one of the few jobs that I've ever discovered in my life where I get to pretend to be an expert on so many things. Right? You know? Yeah. So, I was gonna say there's so many different types of game design and so there many really are. things you need to know. It's like how do you know which one it you're good at which one do you want to do like well, maybe I, I want to be a narrative designer maybe I want to be a level designer how do i know <laughs> i think you just get the opportunity to try and at some point you light on something you're you're particularly good and passionate about and you focus it so like i didn't i didn't i wasn't armed with those words coming into game design when i came into game design i just like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna work on game design i'm gonna contribute to the thinking and as i got into it i re, i quickly found out that I, what i'm good at is what they call a systems designer right you know i'm good at actually writing the rules to the game Right. And, um, you know, how do we actually imagine that if we write rules like, you know, this, this, this and this, what will be the consequence of, of those rules? Um, and how will those rules that I write here interact with these rules over here? So, you know, if players have too much money, what will happen to the game economy? You know, and if players have uh, too much inventory, what will happen to the game economy? So do the monsters have enough hit points, right? You know, I live in a world of spreadsheets, <laughs> you know, you and, how, you know um, and, and I found out early on that I was really good at that, that I, I, a friend of mine, uh, we joke, um, you know, system designers are the ones that 
um, are great at turning games into spreadsheets and spreadsheets into games. So we build mathematical models or procedural rule-based models that describe the action in the game and describe mm -hmm. the economies in the game. And um, that's where, and as my career went forward, I found myself good at that. So I did more of it. And the more of it I did, the better I got at it, you know, and so I created what we call a virtuous cycle, right? And I just kept, you know, I got better and better. And, you know, here I am 20 years later. And, you know, I think of myself as a systems designer. I am now as a, as a creative director, design director type, you know, I, it's, my job is more about enabling other designers to do that work than it is me doing it myself. But I still, in my heart, you know, I got a love for the spreadsheets, right? That's kind of it's kind of where I came where you from. started from. Can't forget yeah, that. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for a game like Rise of Nations, what is the game design process like for creating something like that? Because I've I've used to play it all the time, and it's just an engaging oh, yeah. game. But like, how do you think about all the little things like that at the first, like the drawing board at the very beginning? Well, yeah. you know, it's it's a bit of a journey, and there's a lot of different approaches. You'll get you'll get as many answers to this as as you probably could talk to different game designers. But mm -hmm. for 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 Rise Nation specifically, uh, that used uh, uh, the strong principle of getting the smallest possible game up and running early. So like literally two weeks into that project, uh, you know. Um, we were moving little X's and O's around on a screen. Like, you know, we didn't we didn't go off and build, you know, mighty big systems. We built the smallest possible game that could get up and move on the on the sheet on the on the screen. Like literally, there's a weird looking piece of art that somebody cheesed into the game and the unit can move. Hooray! The unit we moves did today. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the next day, oh hey, two units can move to next to each other and little hit point damage models fly off of them. Oh, oh yeah. And, and, and then then the end of the week, there's 20 units, right? And now oh, now we can have battles, right? Yeah, you know, and, wars. <laughs> and now wars happen, right? And then at some point it's like we start putting in the building model. Like so we literally but the but the but the entire core of the ethos about how we build the game circles around being able to play you play the, the the core loop as we say. The core loop of that experience is, you know, play the game, decide what you need to make the game better, do that thing, play the game, right? You know, make the game better, yeah. play the game, make the game. So you know, the, the, at the heart of that is the game has to be playable at all times. Um, and occasionally that's not real. And there are these little periods of like a week where because, oh, no, now we got to put in some major system and the engineers need time. And the designers are sad because there's not much to do. Almost, yeah. um, and so we write documents or or or, or we don't, um, you know, it just depends. Um, but that whole Rise of Nations process was very centered on essentially iteratively playing the game over and over and over again uh, and making small constant everyday adjustments up and down like you know by the end of it but you know so at the beginning it's like let's make the little units move a year in it's like oh yeah when i play the english versus the germans like you know it seems like the english's power is too powerful in the late game right you know and then yeah. by the and then by the end wow. it's like it, it, by the end, it's like, oh yeah, the, those characters don't look right. Like, let's tune up the pixel. Like, the, the art on the uh, nobody ever wants to play the uh, nobody ever wants to play the e Egyptians. Why not? You know, oh, it's because uh, their power is only yeah, they're pixelated or they don't look as cool or mm -hmm. or their power only or their power or it's still that their power is not balanced because it's really hard to balance powers. Uh, you know, because um, we had like, like twelve races, was it? I don't even remember. It was it was a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't you know they never got completely balanced because it, it was just too much but um we did the best we could and and frankly we would have never had any semblance of balance had we not been playing the damn game every day for for three three and a half years was it yeah three that's years wild. yeah well, that makes sense because it's you have to really try something over and over again to you know balance out but not only that you were trying a new thing every day but you're doing it so small you weren't yeah. like making like, oh my gosh, we have to have all these nations and we have to do all this. And then you get overwhelmed and you're like, oh, no, you're like, we're just going to get one move, unit to move, two units one to move. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I think people lose touch of that, especially indie developers who are just trying to make their first game. It's like, oh my God, I do all this. It's like, first get your character to move, then get it to attack one person, just slowly. That's why we have a yeah. joke in a podcast where it's like, don't make wow, don't make something. Yeah. Simple. Just make a yeah, small, yeah. small game and, and continue to make small games and learn from those small oh. games. Yeah, small tiny, small tiny game, and then improve it in one tiny little way every, each and every day, and and you'll get there eventually. It takes a year, so yeah, patience. So we'll get you there. Yep. So for being a creative director, what have you learned about leadership, and then how did you improve upon that to be a better leader in the environment? 
Well, that's a great question. I mean, first of all, it didn't come to me naturally. I did have to learn it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, I don't, I think most people have this thing where you, you start in a job and eventually you find some success and, and you, and you get promoted your first time and your second time, mostly on the weight of that craft that got you in there. Like, so, you know, your first job promotion isn't about leadership. It's about, Oh, Hey, this dude wrote some cool game. I, yeah, he's a game designer. He, he made that cool assassin mode and he did this other stuff. So let's, let's have him do more stuff. Right. But eventually someday you find yourself with people reporting to you. Right. You know, and then, and then, you know, if you're good at that, then you manage up and, and quickly you realize that, oh shit, management is actually a skill just like everything else. Um, but none of that success you were having as a game designer, as a programmer, as a producer really said whether or not you were good at managing people. So, uh, you know, it, it'll be a skill that you'll cra come crashing into at some point. And uh, for me, it was, I struggled with it a little bit um, because, um, I didn't really realize that right out of the can. I just, you know, tried to do it like most people do it, which is just sort of first of person, force of personality. Hey, I'm a nice guy and people should like me. And, yeah. you know, let's just, you know, everybody, let's all work my way. And, you know, <laughs> that works when everybody is your friend. It doesn't work when they're not. And it sort well, of doesn't work out. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Out. But you have to, but you want, don't want, a, and, and ultimately it's also not great because it ends up with you're selecting for people you like as opposed to see, selecting for people that are badass. Um, and you select for people that you like as opposed to selecting, um, you know, a broadly diverse cast of people who think differently, act differently, value things differently. Uh, it's just not, it's, you know, frankly, it's why our games industry is filled with a bunch of white dudes, right? You know, you, you hire your friends and everybody looks like you, right? You know, and mm -hmm. it's, it, and it's, it's, it's just not great <laughs> for, all <laughs> yeah. the obvious, for all the obvious reasons, right? And so I woke the fuck up one day and said, okay, how do I, how do I understand how, how to how to do this professionally as opposed to just hire you know work with people you like or look like you or something like that and um and so i took it seriously and i read a bunch of books on management you know how to actually uh, lead people how to actually motivate people and then i realized it's only after i started reading all those books that i realized Oh man, I'm such an idiot. This is a game design problem. It's supposed to be what I do for <laughs> like exactly. I feel like such, see that. I, how did I not see that? I feel like such a moron, right? You know, it's like this is just a game design problem. Like I, I totally got this. And it was when that light went off, it was it like boom. I went boom, right? Blew my mind. I was like, why did I even read all those books? And um, and I got as we say in the game, I got good, right? You know, I <laughs> like uh, you know, I started caring about it. I started thinking about it like a game design, uh, and it worked. Um, you know, it's like, well, what do I want? You know, I want, um, I don't necessarily want people that think the same way I do. I, I do want people that want to achieve the same things I want. So that's goal. What is that? That's goal formation, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's just that that's literally game design, right? All right. So now these days, so these days as a creative director, I don't focus on who the people are or how they think or any of those things. Like, like only to the extent that I want a lot of different people who think a lot of different ways, right? You know, uh, you know, that that's all I really want. But the thing that's important is that we're all working to try to build the same experience. So we spend a lot of time saying the game is going to try to do, you know, the game is going to be this way or this way, or we want people to enjoy playing with their friends, or we want people to fight with their friends, or whatever it is that the game is trying to do, making sure that we've thought through what those goals are and in such a way that everybody agrees and understands what we're trying to achieve with the game. Not literally, hey, Bob, you do exactly this, and Sally, you do exactly this. And, it, you know, it's more that, hey, Bob, like, we need to get the game to be more social. This is how we're going to measure whether the game is social or not. Bring us back some cool system that gets us to where we want to be. Hey, Sally, you know, we want this game to make the player feel happy, you know, in this part of the game and sad in this part of the game. How do you think we should do that, right? You know, um, some of these problems that you hand out to people, they can go and solve on their own. Other problems require them to connect to each other mm -hmm. because they're big problems because the games are big. Sometimes these problems are so hard, no one person can handle them. And then we have to get together as a group and collaborate on them, right? You know, and, and brainstorm solutions. And then um, Sally then, rather than just trying to solve it herself, maybe she brings the whole team together, like the super friends, and we, we, we work on the idea, and then Sally's still responsible for it, then she takes the best ideas that we've harvested as a group, brings it, takes it back, you know, builds, a, builds that up, and then brings it back to the group. So different ways, but 
sitting over all this is the creative director kind of helping you know the designers solve the problem so i don't i i like to i i joke but don't joke i don't solve any of the day i don't design anything anymore i mean the thing that i design is the design of the designers right you know Ooh, my job yeah. yeah yeah i don't i don't design the game i set goals for what the game will be uh, you know i was literally doing that today uh you know it's like it, this year like you know, um, I, we were finding like the game should be more this way, should make players feel more like this, should do, you know, hey, designers who own this part of the game, you know, how are we going to get to this feeling, right? Do you have the tools that you need? You, you know, uh, have, do we have a bunch of ideas? Like like in one area, we, we felt like we didn't have enough ideas, so we needed to hold a brainstorming session to get more ideas into the pipeline so the designers had more material to chew on, right? You know, so where are the ideas? Are those ideas connected to mm -hmm. the goals? Because oftentimes you'll just, hey, this game is fun. I've got some cool ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, not deciding not to do things is just as important as deciding to do things, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like in a game like Candy Crush, we've been around for a while, right? You know, a lot of people know that game pretty well. Everybody's got especially if you work on this game, you got 10 things that you think of that you could do. So which it's not that we don't know what we want to do. It's quite the opposite. It's like, well, if I've got 10 ideas and you got 10 ideas and she's got 10 ideas, you know, we it's probably, 30 ideas, like, well, it's 30 ideas, stuck. except, except some of the ideas overlap. So at the end of the day, there's probably 15 mm -hmm. new ideas. Okay. Now what's the order? What order should we, do? we can't do 15 things at once. What's the order that, how do we prioritize that? Once again, that's where I come in. Like I, I help, you know, oh, well, did you realize that if we did idea, you might have thought that idea three was only your third best idea, but did you realize that if we do that, that helps solve this problem over here that you weren't even thinking about, right? Or, you know, if we if we do idea number two, um, that changes what happens next year. Like there's a bigger, there's a, you know, a, a re so I come in with sort of the strategy, you know, and help us understand what that priority is. All the while, just making sure that our designers all feel like they're, you know, um, living their best designer life. That's mm -hmm. that's what that's what a creative director is about. Have you read an experience where they came back with the work and it didn't align with the vision you set out? Oh, sure, right? that happens all that, sure, that happens all the time. It happens for a lot of different reasons too. It happens because I didn't do a good job setting the expectation. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Um, you know, sometimes I make a mistake and don't do a good job and don't set the alarm. Sometimes the designer has a bad day and, you know, so, you know, you know, they mm -hmm. didn't maybe do their best work. Right. And it's like, you know, hey, Sally or hey, Bob, like, you know, you know, maybe we need to try some more ideas because those ideas yeah. don't really meet the bar. Um, and so or, you know, so we try to figure out where the so that's the other thing is fostering a creative, a safe, creative culture where shots on goal don't feel like you're committing like like it's okay to miss a shot yeah. you know it, it should be it should feel more like basketball than <laughs> you know in the where, where yeah yeah that it, that it, sports. The, yeah so that you can miss you, you know it's okay i'm not expecting you to to hit every shot and i by the way sometimes my goals are not perfect either but they're consistently above a certain level right you know mm -hmm. that, that 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 my my shot my shot percentage is good right you know which is why i'm 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 in, I'm in the role I'm in and Sally's, she's great at these classes of, she's a great economy designer. And so her, 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 sometimes she might have a bad day, but her shots are consistently over time far better than mine would be. That's why she's in that role. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I trust her. Um, so being able to, to assess that. So yeah, sending people, sending us back around because either the, the because the goal wasn't met either because the goals were wrong or the attempts didn't go in like that is a common common occurrence and in the moment and any one time that's not a big deal like like you know oh look we didn't we didn't you, you took a shot at the basket and it didn't go in that in that instance right mm -hmm. you do find yourself in clutch situations though right you know keep the basketball metaphor right you know where <laughs> yeah. where where you know situation is tight Ooh, you know <laughs> at the buzzer right you know we need a we need a solution because the game's not good enough uh, you know, according to the last test, and we're running out of time, so clutch shot. And so, yeah, there's clutch moments for sure. Um, and there are times when maybe um, my my shot percentage on the goals I was setting was not as I, you know was not as good as it needed to be. And oh man, I need to step up my game. 
Uh, sometimes you got a, a junior person who is struggling to get their shot percentage up. Like, oh, you know, hey, hey, Fred, you know, you keep coming back with, you know, maybe maybe economy design isn't really your bag. Maybe we should try some narrative design instead. Like, let's see how you, you know, you know, because you, those quests you made last week were fantastic. You know, I'm, it's great that you got to try economy design, but you know, you're just not getting the same kind of, you're just not sinking the sinking as many shots you know, in, in economy as you were in narrative. So maybe we should focus more on narrative. So, you know, we we pay a lot of attention to to what works, but at the same time, we want to give everybody a chance to try different things. So balancing those things out is is also a big part of, of creative direction, you know, getting people connected to where, where they're powerful. And how do you build a culture like that? Just... Well, I think, you know, first thing comes from being creatively safe, right? You know, mm -hmm. to, to actually treat it like it is a shot. Like, that's why I'm leaning into this metaphor so hard, because, mm -hmm. you know, I think I'll, it is the more common situation where people feel they have to be right 100 percent of the time. And you, you do have to work hard to and keep it up so that people know they don't have to be right 100 percent of the time uh, that we value a, a shots on goal percentage mentality of much, much more than we than going away and being safe and right 100 percent of the time doesn't mean you can be a crazy because you do need to maintain a good shot percentage, right? You know, mm -hmm. over time. But any given shot is yeah, shot percentage mat is everything. Shot percentage matters, but any given shot is not what what we're what we're about, right? And in fact, people that have one hundred percent shot percentage are people that are not trying, right? You know, um, you know, they're just trying it, to do something new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna make yeah. it, but it's like you're not doing anything all, that's gonna it's change. All, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all safe. It's all safe. You're taking. You're not shooting enough. Or you're only taking layups, and you know it's just not, you know. So 100% is too is not good. You know, 50% is not good. You know, we want, you know, in design, in, the, in design basketball, we want, you know, we want to set, we want a 0. 0.750 shot percentage, right? You know, I want you to be right 75% of the time, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're below that or above that, then let's figure out how we can move that move that so how do you control. do you think you figured out a way to like inspire people to do that and be less well, safe and be more comfortable well, with trying living that i think living that value is, is it's mm -hmm. I, I mean it sounds reductive and simple but it really is that like you know people are not going to trust you to or believe you until you show them that that that's what that, that you that you that you mean that right mm -hmm. you know the first time somebody messes up and you're like all right that's cool you know, um, go back and do it again. Like there's no, there's no shame, you know, you know, the fact that you did you, that, that nobody's going to rake you over the coals for, for making a, an honest attempt. Right. Yeah. And, and coming back and, you know, there's no, once, once people visibly see there's no shame in trying and that, and more than that, that it's actually expected that, that you try. Like the first time you ever get talked to because your, your shot percentage is too high. It's kind of a moment you'll remember. Right. It's like, yo dude, like, why all the easy shots? <laughs> you, know, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, do you not, are you not excited or, you know, what's, you know, in some ways, you know, making too many shots is even arguably a little bit worse than trying too hard. Right. Cause you know, um, so it's a little embarrassing, frankly, when it happens, um, you know, why, why, why are you taking the easy road? Like, is that, are you not, don't feel it safe? You know, that that's a fun conversation to have, yeah. uh, not in the moment, not in the moment, but because, it, it, because after you've done it, it's like, oh yeah, I, I get it now. I need to, I need to, you know, Again, not be risky, but not be safe either. Like, you know, dial it in at the appropriate level. And different games have different risk appetites. I mean, when you're working with a Candy Crush, you know, you're not going to be doing great capital C crazy stuff. Um, but you also need to be more ambitious. There's a real tendency when you work on a, on, a, on, a, on a big game like Candy Crush to be way too safe some of the time too. Um, Bing Gordon, I think, said, he's like one of the founders of EA, famously said, uh, no design risk is a design risk. Like if you're not taking any risk, that that's risky, mm -hmm. right? You know, because you're going to be stagnant, right? Um, and I think yeah, you know, certainly like the games can get they can plateau. Like friends, Candy Crush, yeah. after like a bunch of levels, you're like it's pretty much the same thing. But then you start adding like different powers or effects or different levels. Then you start to like, oh yeah, which is it's in that game you can do risky, and then another story driven game you can take a risk and try to break the narrative of how games are told, and and you could change things or not, and it's you learn from that. Learn from mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. So making sure that we're 
you know, so that was the first thing, making sure it's a, a, a safe place to be risky, right? To the right amount of risky, right? You know, and then second of all, making sure you're, you're, you know, that we're actually communicating in healthy, productive ways. Um, you know, making sure that our, our design groups, our brainstorms, our design meetings, um, that people are respectful, um, you know, that people um, don't just shoot down other people's ideas uh, for no good reason, that people have, um, that people genuinely value each other's presence and that we're, and that we're constructive and humane to each other at all times and we're respectful. I mean, we're fun, we, we're, we're fun. We like, we, we like to, we like to hang out. We like, you want to be friends, but back to that part of the story again, you know, it isn't about just making, I, I found out when you stop trying to make friends, you'll actually make better friends <laughs> that way. So yeah. making sure. It's like a lot of things in life. You stop trying yeah, and it starts to trying. actually happen yeah. for you. You stop yeah. trying and it starts to happen. Yes, sir. That is exactly right. And so making sure that we're 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 learning that lesson every day. And then recruiting, you know, making sure that the team has that composition. Uh, I mean, at King, we pride ourselves very highly on our, our DNI and uh, diversity inclusion efforts. Um, we have a very diverse team, um, you know, um, strong um you know, in, in every ways that you would measure diversity, right? You know, um, we value that in every possible way. Um, that helps every aspect of the game, but it's particularly important for game design, right? Because um, when you're making a game, uh, you're making it for a lot of different people who think a lot of different ways, you know, and you want your designers to represent the voice of the people that play the game, right? You know, and when you're making a game, for pretty much every human being on the planet, <laughs> you know, you need a, you know, the first group, you, yeah, yeah, you need a, a pretty, a pretty good group of, a pretty diverse group of. I mean, you'll never get your ideal group because you know a game like Candy Crush is played all over the world, right? But you at least need to make an honest try at it, right? You know, and so you want, you want people from different, you know, all across every aspect of diversity, whether it's you know gender, race, age, you know, orientation, doesn't matter. You want, you want to make sure that everybody is a, a strong, um, a strong individual who feels like they can be heard on the team. And so making sure our design spaces are spaces where that's true is also a big part of, um, of, of a creative director's role. And when you, do you hire people or do you choose who to uh, hire? Well, well, I don't know. I, I, I mean, yes, I, I'm part of the hiring process. I mean, we're okay. a big company, so we have an HR department that we have a recruiting department. Um, mm -hmm. So if yeah, if somebody was hiring for a design position, I would be, you know, on Candy Crush specifically, I would be part of the uh, the hiring chain. Absolutely. Um, but it's not one person that hires. We, you know, the team yeah. hi hires people and um, uh, we have a, a more formal process in, in a smaller group. You know, I think game design companies as a, as a whole tend to be very um, um, focused on the team. So I, I can't think of any place I've ever worked where one person hires, mm -hmm. you know, people um, as, as, you know, arguably the most senior designer uh, on the team. I, you know, tend to come in toward the end of the process after someone's been sort of validated. Um, but my voice is just one of many when it comes to hiring somebody. So um, when you guys all decide on who to hire, what do you guys look for? And what should people who are trying to get a job, like, focus on? Well, again, it, 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 for game design, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be focused on, I think it's going to be the same whether it's, if you're doing junior, trying to get it as a junior position, which it sounded like what you're asking, you know, again, finding some, focusing on having done something, right? Mm -hmm. And if you haven't done something professional, because, it is your first job that you're trying to get, then that means scholastic project, self-initiated project, game jam project, uh, IGDA project, like, right? you know, uh, getting practical experience is a huge force, a uh, big advantage, right? When it comes to, to proving that you can do something, because frankly, if you haven't done something, it's the old, you have to have experience to get experience problem, right? You know, and when, it, when, when there's a position that five people have are applying for, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that the person who has done it before, it stands a much better chance of getting the job than the person who has it, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to you want to think like a game designer, right? And think that the objective is to, you know, to, to cross that problem off the list, right? You know, and so do the smallest possible thing that you can do. And and frankly, the bar isn't that high. Like, you know, you wanna you wanna you wanna you wanna have some projects under your belt go to a weekend game jam like it's a weekend right you know if you really want that job if you really want to be a game designer then mm. 
you know, it's not, it's really not that hard, right? If you've got more broader talents, like you have some programming skills, you have some art chops, maybe build something yourself. Not everybody does, uh, but that's an option for some people. Build something in Roblox. Like, you know, Ooh. you don't have to build a whole thing from the ground up. Go build a game in Roblox. Like that, hey, go build a game in Roblox and then make some money on it. Like, and then show up at your interview saying, hey, I got this. <laughs> yeah. You're you know? hired. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. easy for us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's the kind of thinking you need. You know, the, the answer is to build something, right? You know, and uh, if you're a designer, if you're an artist, you know, if you're an engineer, um, I, I can't think of any situation in which, you um, building a thing is not almost a better answer to that question than anything else, right? You know, um, yeah, you can dial up your skills. Yeah, you can read some books. Those things help, right? You know, putting additional skill line items on your resume never hurts, but having actually completed a project so that when you show up in the room and have that interview, assume, you know, you get, you know, having the story to tell about how you did this thing, how you accomplished some things, how you made some mistakes and then learn from them, right? You know, that's the thing that's going to get you the. That's the thing that's going to get you the position, right? And then you also look for anything that, besides the technical skills, like that you're a good communicator, good work with those good others. Communicator, you know, you know that you've gone through the process front to back, which falls into having done the thing, but you know um, that you know what it's going to be like to actually complete a project. That you. Um, you're a good team collaborator, that you're somebody who isn't too arrogant, you know, um, who, you know, or is, is is bold enough to speak up, you know, that you're a good team member, right? That you can hold a position on the field, to keep with our sports metaphor, right? You know, and uh, collaborates with other people. That's going to be really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, it's a... It's a lot doing interviews. You get stuck in the technical stuff, and then, but you forget that like part of it too is just like, are you able to work with other people? Yeah. And I know a lot of people can be like introverted, and it's hard to like reach out. But I think like meeting other people, great communities like the clubhouse or the, the game dev community or other communities or Reddit is a great place to like meet people and just discuss game design and, and to, to work with others. That's why. So like, what do you recommend for people who have a hard time? Branch, like reaching out to people, how they can go and meet people and work on their like communicating and teamwork skills? Yeah, pretty good question. So there are a couple ways that you could do that, a couple, three ways. One is uh, you just said Clubhouse. Like there's a there's an easy, right now in this moment, Clubhouse is super accessible to people and you can get on there and start talking with, frankly, some pretty senior people, right? You know, and get some exposure. Um, they've had a couple of, um, uh, even a couple of recruiting uh, uh, rooms where people can come in and practice uh, interviewing and, and even not just practice, but actually be interviewed, right? Um, you can, they also do things like this with the IGDA, uh, the IGDA.org, which is the International Game Developer Association. Mm -hmm. uh, there are chapters everywhere. Um, those are, uh, there are lots of SIG groups for helping people do um, uh, collaborative projects, or to give job opportunities, or to even do resume tune-ups, you know, like like let's all look at each other's resume and and and, and knock those up, a, you know, you know, a few notches. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are probably the best places that I could think of um, to do that. Um, there are a couple of internet clubs, you know, uh, on Facebook and stuff too. I mean, there's lots of different groups, but you know, honestly, if I'm just gonna narrow the field a little bit i'd get on clubhouse yesterday obviously i'm pretty biased i'm a big fan of clubhouse mm -hmm. um but um if it was before clubhouse i would just tell always tell people you know join your local igda chapter that was my go-to recommendation mm -hmm. yeah igda is really great you have one in la i think it's the second largest in the uh in the world first i think it's finland or something oh wow but, uh, <laughs> yeah right well they get the whole country we get the whole city so it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but no it's great because they do amazing events like every month where they connect people with diverse like diverse people in the group they get yeah. like lawyers like different type of people where they discuss things that you might have never thought about like hey i need to actually get a lawyer and discuss how i can keep my business safe my money safe and they're not like screwed over or you know so uh, yeah that, i think that's very important and also clubhouse i saw that you were posting a lot of stuff on your twitter about clubhouse and you also did one with ben tristam so like how did you get started with that and how did someone get invited to a clubhouse Oh, um, I just mostly, we have a games industry clubhouse room that I just wandered into right after it got created, and I just mostly hang out there, and just that's part of why it's so powerful. I just, I just hang out there, and I talk to people, and um, and then because I talk to a lot of people, and I, you know, a little bit because 
I do have some experience, so people are probably more prone to talk to me than 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 some people. Uh, but but at the same time, I'm talking with a bunch of students in there all the time. Like you know, I think people that just find their voice and step up and start communicating. Um, uh, you find yourself, the more you communicate, the more people want you to, to join their group. And, um, yeah, I, I, mostly uh, people come into that room and say, Hey, we're holding another room who wants to be a part of it. And people just volunteer mm -hmm. or, you know, and, and of course the big part of these rooms is that you don't even really have to be invited. You just show up and, you know, uh, certainly the games industry clubhouse rooms are all, anybody who's interested can just raise their hand and come up on stage. Right. So you don't have to wait for an invite to be to participate oh, okay. in any of those things yeah i thought they were um, invite only no no some rooms are invite only but the games industry uh, club rooms are all uh, all participation so so where um, do you find that you go in clubhouse and just search game dev uh games industry there's a literally a club called games industry uh -huh. uh, and we run a, a 24 hour room called games industry cocktail hour that's always open and that's sort of our anchor room and from that uh, there's at least one event every day. Some days there's more than one event uh, where we have specialty breakout rooms like, you know, like, hey, let's talk about AI today or, hey, let's talk about spatial computing or how to break into games or, and, and these are just, these aren't a formal thing. These are just, hey, let's just, whoever wants to talk about this, let's just go talk about it, right? You know, these are these are more like IGDA SIG groups, right? Where it's just a bunch of people who, there's, there's no special marquee speaker. It's just, you know, whoever's whoever's down to talk about that thing goes off and talks about it, right? Um, which means it's really accessible, again, really accessible for for junior people or people with literally zero industry experience to come along and participate and, and to become not just a, a, a listener, but an actual uh, member of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I know you're saying like AI and spatial recognition, but like, is there any, should anybody feel intimidated? Like, should they come prepared or should it be a topic? Yeah, just like show about up. Game show design up. rules. Show just up. show up. <laughs> show up and learn, you know, show up if you're interested. If you're not interested, just leave. You know, that's part of the clubhouse magic. That's why I'm a big fan. Yeah. Like, you know, um, show up, learn when you can, contribute where you can and, and, and disappear. Um, I think it's, um, I think it's pretty awesome. Um, it does you know, um, I think it's part of a package of things, right? You know, sitting and listening in club, uh, sitting and participating in clubhouse or anything isn't getting anything built, though. So uh, I yeah, will true. remind you to my other advice, which is actually go build something, right? You know, get, get in get in clubhouse to get advice. You know, listen to podcasts like this one to get advice. You know, um, but balance that with um, you know getting your hands dirty and uh, either writing some docs or writing some code or building a mod you know again download roblox man make some you know make some money while you're trying out something maybe you get lucky now for anybody that's like trying out these different things like building roblox doing a little little game what would you tell for people who feel like they get stuck or they don't have like the creativity or they've been trying something and it just is not working and they feel like they're not really progressing to get to the point where they feel like they can apply for a job. Like, what kind of advice would you give for them? Well, that's where working in groups Matt, fixes that, right? You know, you get on a, you get a game jam or you get on a project with the IGDA and you're going to not be stuck by your stuck in your own head. Right. Which can happen. Totally can happen. Like you're saying, like, you know, you, you're like, Oh man, I just can't fit. I, I, you, you need, I need, I for myself need other humans to bounce ideas off of. Right. I actually, I'm what we call a think to a speak to thinker. Right. You know, uh, when my, when I'm alone in my own head, uh, my best ideas don't come out. I have to actually talk about them with another person to get them my best ideas. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would want to get in a room with somebody or virtually or otherwise, right. You know, cause we don't get in rooms anymore, but, um, you know, get on zoom with my buddies and, um, you know, either, either talk about it or start working, working on a code, whatever, but, um, yeah, find a group and talk it out. That's my answer to that. And I used to stay up to date to everything. Like, do you well, constantly really read your books? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I read some books. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm good for a couple of game books a year. Um, you know, it's not like there are that many game books that come out. Um, read a bunch of websites. And then I try to, you know, again, game literacy is important. I, I mean, I just naturally play a lot of games. At the very least, you need to play games, you know, in your domain. Um, you know, I'm playing half a dozen games right now. Um, they're all pretty cool. So that's one of the fun parts of the job. If you like games, you know, part of your job is playing games, right? You know, so I play some games in my genre space, you know, so competitors to Candy Crush specifically. But that's hardly the only place I play games. 
like I was saying in my the early example at the beginning of this podcast, some of my better best ideas come from completely other kinds of games. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm playing like an artist. <laughs> yeah, you steal like an artist. Exactly. I mean, I'm playing online D and D. I'm playing Valheim. Um, you know, I'm playing Hades. I'm playing Subnautica. I'm playing you know a bunch of uh, cool prototypes of games that. I can't talk about because I work at a game company, right? Yeah, because we make yeah. we make more than one game, right? You know, and so we've got other games that we're working on, so that's fun. So you're playing prototype games uh, in addition to your own. Um, so yeah, so I've got a whole bunch of games I'm I'm actively playing at any given time, and that's uh, it's an enjoyable part of the job, but it's also sometimes a job. Like when I play, you know, I play with my game mind, but I also play with my designer mind, and sometimes I play a game and then I will go and I break it down, and I do, you know, I don't just play the game; I do homework afterwards, right? You know, and try to think about how that game works and if there's any parts of that any lessons from that game that can help me with the projects that I'm working on. And so what are some of the questions you ask yourself like when you go do your homework? Well, it depends on the game that I'm playing. Sometimes it's just a random thought like, you know, you know, like like but I think some of the standard questions I ask are largely so is this game solving one of my problems? So I keep a list of the problems on my 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 current game, like like I literally have a two two slides in a, in a PowerPoint deck for the game I'm working on right now. One of the which is a is a list of the the game's strengths and weaknesses, mm-hmm. and the other slide is a list of all the weird design issues that I'm trying to solve. Right. So when I look at a game, you know, like you know, or we're we're gonna play Valheim today. You know, it's like oh, as I'm playing the game, I'm I'm kind of in the back of my head wondering. Does any, any experience I'm having here today help me with any of those problems that I've that I've listed, right? Because I've thought about them officially. Um, then beyond that, um, you know, what is there anything about what I'm doing in this game that's just fun in a new way? Like, is there, is there some new experience here, right, that I've never had before? And if there is, and there's often not, to be honest, like because you know, games. Don't aren't usually very new. They're just um, they're incremental. They're not they're yeah. not they're not sudden change your world. I mean, sometimes they are. Like Hades was definitely for me was like a OMG. Where did this come from? Right? Mm-hmm. You know, a um, lot of people who took risks. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people took. Yes, sir. That is exactly right. A lot of people took some big risks. I mean, games like Hades make me wonder why I'm even a game designer. I feel like a total. <laughs> I feel like a total fraud. No. Playing. Oh, oh man, that game, was, that game was so. <laughs> That game is legit in every way. Like, there's no aspect of that game that isn't slider set to ten, right? You know, um, but see, but the, but I learned an immense amount um, on um, on just how far you can go with uh, character depth in that game, how far you can go with um, some great thoughts on uh, generative narrative. I mean, there's just all sorts of uh, that, that game is a masterclass in, in a lot of different ways, right? And um, yeah, so thinking about. You know, sometimes it's just as little as, oh, man, I can't believe they put this much love and polish into some aspect of the game that I wouldn't have expected them to. Like in Hades, like they just wrote more dialogue than I ever would have imagined you would have written that much dialogue. If you if you before Hades, if you had come to me and we were trying to make a game like Hades, I I freely admit that I would have looked at the the person and said, no, there's no way we're going to write that much text. Like, forget it. That's that's, that's a total waste of time. Like I would have just I would have just missed that out of hand. Um, and I would have been very wrong, <laughs> you know, very, very wrong. You know, so that game totally took me to school and educated me on on what can happen when you put that much content into the, into the game, right? You know, that it takes on a quality that's bigger than just the sum of the parts. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that game took me to school in that way, right? You know, it's not that Hades has anything to do with Candy Crush, right? You know, but um, but learning that you can put, you can essentially load more narrative into a bucket than you thought was possible, and it, look what it does to the game, right? That was the lesson out of there. Maybe I'll get to use that lesson tomorrow. Maybe I'll use it five years from now, right? You know, mm-hmm. sometimes the lesson doesn't is not immediately relevant, and then you just sort of park it in the mental file or in the notebook, right? You know, until you and, need it, yeah. Until you need it, exactly. So what do you think Hades got right? Like, what do you think they focused on? Was it Shit. dialogue, Every, narrative, everything, everything? Everything, everything. Like, that's part of the magic of Hades. It's like I said, it's a 10 on everything. I think the real magic is that um, that it does it with a light hand. So, like, you don't, you don't have to be a roguelike fan or a narrative fan or a systems geek or any of those things. They all sort of just sort of roll in together, right? You know, and it, and it kind of kind of slowly 
leads you through them, right? You know, it's not it's not the hardest core game in the world, right? You know, um, but by the end of it, it's pretty damn hardcore, right? You know, and so it tr- kind of tricks you. It kind of makes it, I think the, buzz, the word that we'd use is accessible, right? It makes it accessible. Um, and you don't have to be somebody who loves great story, but you wake up halfway through that game realizing that, oh man, I may, I may not, maybe I don't think I like story, but I really like story, right? You know, at least in this game, right? You know, or I'm not the kind of person that likes roguelikes, but I like this roguelike, right? You know, you know, that it sneaks up on, that game sneaks up on you in a lot of ways. That's where the magic happens. But like, what do you think is their number one thing they were focusing on the whole time? Like, we have to hit this part, and then that's how they got the game. They got like, was it like player experience? Was it oh, narrative? Know. Was it accessible? Do you think that was the thing? I they think were... I feel like super all of Super Giants games um, are all about putting the player in a space. Like you know, you, you feels like you're in a place, right? You know, and the characters. Well, and the characters you meet belong in that place, right? You know, and so you know, I you feel like you're Zagreus going through hell because you know the art style and the characters, and then the mechanics all sort of support that. I, I feel, I mean, I could be yeah. completely wrong. I fully expect that we'll I'll go read an interview where they say completely completely different than what I'm saying, but like they're the ones who know. I don't know. I just play yeah. the game, but like, but like for me, it feels like they started from from wanting the player to inhabit a certain fantasy and work their way out, uh, you know, from there, as opposed to starting from a game mechanic. A lot of games start from the core mechanic, you know, and build up from there. Um, I feel like they went the other direction. and That's probably they, why it worked so well. Yeah. Because then people get immersed, and then they they don't even care about anything else, and they're like, the story's great <laughs> because I feel like I'm there. Because so, it matters. Yeah, because yeah. it matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. It's pretty well, this has been a lot of fun, this whole interview and this podcast. Um, so near the end, I like to do this whole challenge, kind of like our sure. lectures, where you give a challenge at the end of the uh, podcast to all the people listening to do afterwards. It could be anything related to game design or programming or whatever you feel is a good challenge. But yeah, so give a challenge to the game.tv students. You can have time to think about it, too. Okay, so I'm going to give everybody a challenge. All right. Um, Can it refer to an existing game? Uh, yeah. Do I have to, or should it not? Like, what's what's better? Can I? I don't want to assume that everybody's played the same games I've played because there are a lot of damn games uh, at the same time. Um, I mean, it can relate to all games. That'd be good, but if we can do one game that way. They can go out and play it as a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think you know. I I I think for me, um, so. There's one type of genre of games. So I'll, I'll 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 reveal something about myself. Um, there are lots of things in game des- games I don't like. It's why I love games so much. Except when I like, I like, I hate this thing. Except when I like it. Does that make sense? You yeah, know, it makes yeah. sense to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Well, it might not make sense to everybody, but 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 I, <laughs> there's a lot of things I I don't like until I like it. it because you know I got a threshold for it, right? So it has to be really good, and then I love it, right? And one of those things for me is platforming. Right. You know, I don't identify as somebody who likes to play platformer games. Right. You know, yeah, yeah, except that the really best platformer games are really amazing. Right. You know, Um, and so there are some platforms. So, you know, I, I, I would break with that and say, you know, there are some some platformer games that are amazing. So what I would challenge people to do, especially if they want to be game designers, is to come up with a list of three, at least three games that are that you love that are in a genre or type that you hate, right? You know, or dislike, like like find experiences. Cause that's what, because if you remember all the way back to the beginning of the story I told, like part of being a game designer is not caring about the game. It's about breaking those things down and stealing like an artist, looting those, mm-hmm. you know, breaking games down and looting them for parts, right? You know, so what I want you to do, if I would want to, what you do, and if I was, if this was an interview, I'd want to see that list, right? You know, I'd want to, I'd want to know why you didn't like platformers or whatever it is for you. Maybe you don't like racing games or something like that. So then tell me what, tell me a racing game you do like, or at least can convince yourself that there is some part of that racing game that you want to loot for parts, right? You know, because it's so amazing as a piece of design. So, so what I really want to encourage people to do is think like a designer and take a game apart and steal the engine out of that out of that uh, out of that Ford Bronco and put it in your you know, <laughs> like literally literally take it and loot it for parts, right? So um, find it, find it. Find a genre that you don't like and then loot it for parts. That's my that's my challenge. It's a perfect challenge. <laughs> I can't wait to see what people do. <laughs> but yeah, so this has been so much fun. Thank you for coming on and thank you for giving oh. me your advice and all game design stuff. 
Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. So at the end, I usually pass the mic on to you if you want to do any last minute shout outs or quotes, inspirations. Uh, thanks for coming on again. And the mic's all yours. Uh, okay. Well, my shout out is to the immortal Sid Meier, who said, you know, games are a series of interesting decisions. Uh, so if your game or game idea isn't coming up with fun decisions game after game, um, you're forgetting to make your game fun. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening. You can find all courses at GameDev.tv or in the show notes at a discounted price. Get started with your game development journey today.